Hello, everybody. This is Gino Barbaro, one of the co-hosts of the Wheelbarrow Profits podcast. Here on my right, my buddy, my brosif, filling in for the Mr. Stenziano is Josh Rusin. Josh, how we doing, bro? Doing well over here, Gino. How about yourself? I'm doing good, Josh. Uh, we've got a great guest today, but first, I want to talk about what we've been doing the last couple months. What do we got coming up in October? Well, we have uh, our, our live event this year. It's going to be our second annual live event. It's actually going to be a big turnout. We're expecting between three to 350, maybe even 400 guests. Gino, you know, tell them a little bit more about it and why they should come. Well, guy we got on today, Omar Khan, is one of the speakers there. And we've been highlighting our speakers for the last few months on our podcast just to show you the quality of speakers we have there. It's, the, it's all about buying right, managing right, and financing right. The whole three-legged framework of our multifamily series. And I'm excited to have it. I had it in Asheville because it's on a lot of people's bucket list, right, Josh? It's a great town, weekend, we're gonna have a lot of fun. My whole family is gonna be there. So you're gonna be able to meet our six kids. My wife is gonna be there. The kids gonna be in the back selling a little bit of swag. So we're gonna have a good time. Absolutely, I mean, you're gonna be able to meet Students are in the game right now, meet our vendors, learn a lot and really explode your motivation to take the action and start getting results. So check in the show notes down below. Uh, it's Multifamily Mastery 2018. Today we have with us Omar Khan, great guy. I, I don't even know where I met Omar. I think I met him through Reed Goosens, who was a speaker last year, who is going to be the MC this year of our event. Omar is 10 years of investing across real estate commodities, over three and a half billion dollars in capital financing and M&A transactions. He syndicated large multifamily dollar deals across the U.S. He is a syndication whiz. He's talk, we're going to talk today all about deal and analytica. It's a software revolution taking over multifamily syndication underwriting. And, you know, we were talking before we jumped on how some of these guys underwriting these deals just make you want to cry. So I, I, we're going to hit underwriting today. We're going to hit deal syndication today. So without further ado, Mr. Omar Khan, how are we doing? We're doing great. Thank you, guys. It's a great honor to finally be on the Jake and Gina. So before I start... I don't know why. As soon as you introduce yourself, I wanted to say, I don't hear the words G-Daddy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know why? Because I can't say G-Daddy. Because my wife yells at me when I reference myself to that. So when she hears the podcast, she's going to say, you called yourself G-Daddy. So that's the J-Daddy over here. You should have said that. Anyway, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, the G-Daddy has a big question for you. Why multifamily? How did you get into this whole journey of getting into multifamily and you know where you are today? Well, I mean, first of all, why not? Number one, you know, that's, that's always a good question. <laughs> Look, what happened is I moved from Canada a couple of years ago, and just because I've worked in banking m and for a little while, I had access to a good network of people, and I managed small bits of money for them up north. And when I was moving here, I had some of my own money, some of my family's money, and a couple of friends' family's money. They're like, hey, if you're moving to the U.S., we love the U.S. If you're thinking of buying some stuff, let us know. So that's how I kind of inadvertently got into multifamily, because I you know, did analysis, I talked to a lot of people, I talked to over like 200 people. And you know, the more I talked, the more I realized, you know, the financial analytical part of me realized there's so many more moving pieces in multifamily that there's, which I mean, adds to the complexity, don't get me wrong, but it also means that there's so many more ways that you can bring value. So that's what I really, you know, got down to. And then I live in Dallas, which is ground zero for the multifamily uh, cult, as I like to call it. So here I am. So why do you think there's a cult in Dallas? I mean, I can give you my opinion. I think the job growth has been fantastic. I mean, it's just exploding. It seems like there's no barriers to entry, new product coming on, new influx of people. What do you think is unique or really positive going on in the Dallas market? Well, I think not just, first of all, Dallas, but Texas in general, uh, primarily. Look, outside, honestly, I'll be honest with you, I have friends on both coasts and Canada all over the world, and they still think Texas is all in gas. So I think personally, Texas, I don't think has done a great job in marketing itself. But if you come down here, you realize oil and gas is maybe 15, 18, 19% of the entire economy. And it's a pretty well diversified economy. And just to give it context, what I tell a lot of my Canadian investors and friends now is look, the Texas economy is bigger than the entire country of Canada. That's how much bigger it is. And it's bigger than the entire country of Canada with 7 million less people. And Canada, by the way, is considered a very prosperous country. You know, it's not considered a poor country. So if anything, you've got better weather. I mean, relatively better weather. It's still blazing hot here, so it's the other extreme, right? Uh, more diversified economy. And then people are obviously more densely packed. So Texas is big, but really when we talk Texas, we talk the Texas Triangle, you know, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, you know, that sort of little triangle. Yep. There's so much business, Gino, that honestly, at least in the past 15 years, you could have bought something. You could have done all the stupid mistakes you wanted to do and you would have still made money. 
So talk about those stupid mistakes. What stupid mistakes come to mind? Well, stupid mistakes comes to mind is, for instance, in the past at least, right? You could have, for instance, bought really bad assets. Essentially, let's put it this way. If you were forecasting that, you know, you're going to increase revenues by, say, 10%. Right, and you did everything wrong. You didn't manage right, you didn't buy right, you didn't buy right, operate right, manage right, didn't sell right, right? You would have still hit your number because the economy was going up. So on the sale, you would have just made so much more money that it would have covered all your past sins, mm. operational sins, right? Then for instance, nobody could have predicted the amount and volume of people that are moving. So just to give you an example in Dallas, look, Toyota is moving from California. Right? Yeah. That's six to 9,000 people that are moving and the average job that is moving is over a hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. You know, people talk about Amazon all the time, you know, with headquarter two and all that, but think about it. Nobody talks about Toyota and Toyota moved 9,000 people, hundred thousand dollars minimum job. And that just made the prices of houses and multifamily assets, at least in the Frisco, Plano and surrounding areas, just jack up because guys are selling their 900, 800, 900 million dollar house in California. Mm-hmm buying a $500,000 mansion in Texas mm-hmm. and pocketing everything else. And their kids go to a better school, they live in a better neighborhood. I mean, how could you lose? Mm-hmm. So before we get into the deal on the writing, what about the crystal ball? Tell, yeah. me what's, tell me what scares you about multifamily going forward, about the Dallas market. If you see any pitfalls, maybe rates going up, you know, the economy slowing down, what do you see can put a crimp in or can really hurt people? Because we were talking off camera, off air also about people just making dumb mistakes and overpaying. What do you see as potential pitfalls going forward? Gino, you know, I, I don't think there's a lot of macroeconomic, you know, the big, you know how we talk about, everybody talks about the 2008 crisis or something like that. I don't think an event of just, as per my, at least understanding, an event of that magnitude or proportion hopefully should happen. Because my God, I can't take two of two great depressions in my young life. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I'm good with one, right? But uh, what I do feel is happening is, especially the more people I talk to in the local market is that a lot of guys, and it's mostly guys, because women don't make these kind of mistakes. It's, it's sadly, <laughs> right? A lot of guys take a weekend course or they'll, I don't know, take some guru's course who says, I'm going to give you financial freedom. And, or some, you know, one of those buzzwords. And then they certainly think they're a tax strategist, they're a property manager, they're an underwriter, they're a broker. And my point is, look, guys, you can't take a weekend course and do all this kind of stuff. Look, look at you guys, you guys, we were, we were talking about this, right? You guys have busted your behind for like five, eight, 10 years, just to be at a level where you can even start considering calling yourself novices. And you're very humble about that, right? And that was a lot of hard work, man. Look, you took the hard, you took the hard knocks. Look, you moved from New York, right? You moved to Tennessee, right? Or Florida. I moved to right? Florida, yes. Right? I mean, how many people, Gino, at your stage in life did it? How many of your friends are doing that? You tell me. Well, very, that's the problem because people aren't committed. You got to be committed. Yeah. And I think everyone, well, let's go, let's go into the political realm. I hear all these experts all over the place. We're supposed to have a crash when Trump took over. We're supposed to have this. We're supposed to have everything happen to prognosticators. The experts are out there. The problem with experts are they stop learning or they just don't think outside the box. That's the problem with multifamily. It's constant learning because the market is constantly shifting. You have to take what the market gives you. And three years ago, I was buying at ACAPs. Now in Tennessee, we got to buy six and a half to seven caps. Um, you know, three years ago, four years ago, maybe rents were only going up three percent. Rents are going up a little bit more now. Believe it or not, I don't know why, because the because the the, the microclimate there is where there's just not enough there's not enough inventory there. So you have to know your own market. So it's a constant yeah. learning process, and that's the problem. You know, I always tell my kids, pick up a tennis racket, start swinging it. But if you see an expert, he swings it one certain way. He can't think of swinging it another way. And that's the problem. When you become an expert at something, you can't think of doing it a different way. Just talk at the gurus. You can't do no money down deals. You, of course you can. There's just a certain asset that you can do it. So not to get off the tangent, but that's what I, I think that's real. I think that's really important. Yeah, Gino, but you can only say this after going through the school of hard knocks, doing the hard work, putting in the long hours. You didn't take a weekend course. And now you're here with a award-winning podcast, you're running your shows, you know, you have a great portfolio, you're hiring people, you're educating people. You couldn't could have done that overnight. No, that's true. No, I agree. It required a lot of commitment, right? No, I and agree. that's what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. How did you come across the deal analytical software? How did you actually envision it? Because I know you must have struggled with yourself because every entrepreneur has an amazing idea that has those self-doubts where am I overreaching? Am I good enough to do this? Where, where did the idea come from? Yeah, you're laughing because you know. Because I, I feel the pain, brother. <laughs> Look, what happened is when I moved, again, just as part of my story, when I moved here, I had a classical training in finance valuation. I did CFA. I mean, man, all I did all day, every day 
I got paid a really good salary. It was valuation, oil and gas leases, you know, portfolio management, you name it. That's what I did, right? Mm -hmm. So when I moved down here, I realized, okay, I understand there's lots of moving parts, right? Property management, broker relationships, you know, just managing people, also being a good manager of people. So maybe I, I don't know enough about that, but what I do know is the finance, stone cold. I can look at a valuation and tell you within 10 minutes, yay or nay, with a reasonable degree of confidence. And the more I started talking to people, the more I realized, it's like, damn, dude, like, I mean, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but hell, I'm a lot smarter than you are, man. <laughs> right? Uh -huh. right? So I started looking at people's underwriting and I'm like, man, I wouldn't touch this with a 10 foot pole because you're going on a hope and prayer right now. And that's not a strategy or not a repeatable strategy at least. Right. So I started building my own models because I was like, look, man, if I got to invest my own money, I can have some confidence on what's going on. I can't be flying in blind. So once I started developing a lot of my own models and stuff like that, then, you know, Reed, me and Reed were talking one day, one of these, what had happened is that I was valuing a deal. The most I could come up to was 18.5, 18.6 million dollars on this portfolio. And my partner makes fun of me, says, you know, you have the gift of cynicism, right? You're always cynical, right? I was like, okay, whatever. So I, he's like, okay, you gotta be a little liberal. Let's open the taps up a little bit. So the most we could stretch that deal valuation was 19.3, maybe 19.4 million dollars. Once you, know, you start so stretching though, careful, because that no, stretching is very hard. You gotta have a strike price. So yeah, yeah, I like to see. Gets, no, 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 hold on, it gets better. But we're like, okay, man, this, it says we're just stretching ourselves, right? You know how much it got sold for, for one of these gurus that are in Dallas, really popular guru? They paid $23 million for that deal. Wow, so you stretch it to 19, 20 million, 21, and they overpaid, they overpaid 2 million on top of the 21. That's, yeah, so I mean, that's, and that's, and what I would, what amazes me, I'm baffled, not baffled, but I, it happens every day. How does a bank even underwrite that? How does a bank even give financing for that? That's what amazes me, right? Gino, look, my point is, uh, frankly, I don't even care. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I realized, look, I, I was joking with my friend. I was like, you know, they better hit the biggest oil well right below their apartment <laughs> building. Because if they don't hit an oil right below their apartment, these guys are toast. Yeah, but I'm, try I'm trying to educate people and I'm trying to keep people motivated and inspired. And when, when you hear something like that, you have to go back to your community and to your students to say, well, guys, they overpaid by $4 million, but we got to keep going. So my whole thing is, how did it happen? How did they come up with their valuation? I'm going to save you a ton of money because you're not going to buy that deal and make a big mistake on that deal. Because yeah. three years from now, when your IO is up, you're in big trouble because I think it's going to oh, be yeah. So I, I want people to stay engaged because what happens when you're first starting out, you're going to lose a lot. You're going to lose a lot of inspiration, motivation by like, I'm not even in the ball game. And a lot of our students aren't. And I'm glad because I mean, at least I'm teaching them yeah. how to underwrite a deal properly. But at the same time, when you go and you put in six, 10, 15, 20 letter of intents, and you're 20% not even close to a deal, I know I'm doing something right, but it's hard to keep them engaged. That's my only, that was my only concern with that. Look, I agree with you, Gino, but the way I look at it is, is I might as well be a little disappointed right now and mm -hmm. not lose a boatload of money, then be really happy right now and lose a boatload of money Good. three years. <laughs> Good, I like I'm gonna, that. It's, it's like, yes. do I want to take the punch that I see coming or do I mm -hmm. want to get take the punch that I never even see coming and then yes. not see? You know, yes. it's that sort of deal. Mm -hmm. So how did you come up with the deal analytical? What does it include? How did you envision the product? So what happened essentially is when I was talking with Reed as well, we decided to go, we decided to take a soup to nuts deep dive into this deal, this whole syndication. So we had our own model, right? You know how we run things, all of that. Mm -hmm. But we went through a lot of people's like OMs, you know, those marketing materials, PPMs, all of that kind of stuff to basically make a robust enough model because our idea was, look, when we give it to one of our analysts, I, I want to be the least amount of person. Like I, I want the least amount involved. So I want to come in once they've done those, say when they're 80, 90% of the way there, I want to come in and you know do my magic on top. But I don't want to be the guy taking it from zero to 80 myself, number mm -hmm. one. Number two, I'm a big believer that if you can automate something in your life, you should automate it. You know, we have a computer for a reason. Go automate it, man. I mean, it's not rocket science. So that's basically our thing because we needed it in our own business. And me and Reed really joke that look, even if nobody buys it, will buy it. That's right. Because we need it in our own business. And it was such a, and what then happened is that the more people we talk to, the more people keep telling us, and these are guys who've done say 80, 90, hundred million dollars of deals. Dude, I've been trying to look for this thing all my life. Like I, I, I get these softwares, I try them out and you need a PhD in mathematics just to figure out how to run the software or the numbers I get are so off that I don't even have to do any math to know the numbers are off. Because we are in the business. We do this day in and day out, you know. I mean, we've talked about this. I've showed you some of the stuff, right? So for us, we know what's going on. 
So when we know what's going on, we already know what your pain point is before you even know your picture. So give me some functionality. What, what, how do you envision the product working? What do you, what do you, what do you, how does it separate itself from other underwriting calculators? Because everyone thinks they can go download a calculator yeah. on Excel and make it work and all right. the numbers look good. How, how, does, how does yours, and you're laughing because I know, because I've done the same thing and I know people go. And the funny thing, me and you, I, the, what you told me, it always sticks out of my mind is you're like, guys are underwriting deals and buying deals if the box is green. If it's red, yeah. they don't buy it. So I thought that was the funniest thing in the world. But I'm, you know it's true. I know it's true, and I'm laughing because I've heard it myself. So uh, you know, give me some of your, uh, I guess, differentiating factors on your, on, your, on your product. So the big thing right off the top is, number one, look at monthly results. Don't look at annual results. And the reason why I say that is, look, typically guys are trying to do a value add deal, right? Mm -hmm. So we and, we and you both, I mean, you're the master of this thing. We know the first 24, 18 to 24 months are hell. You get through that thing, I mean, you're good to go. It's plug and play after that, mm -hmm. right? So if you're only looking at annual numbers as an example, it masks so much of the volatility. And I'll give you an example. What happens that you straight up run out of cash, say in March, as an example, and just make another number, right? And then by October, you've caught up, right? Just because, you know, you turn the thing around. So when you look at it December to December or annually, you feel like, hey, I never really had a problem. Right. But no bank, no property manager, no lender. Nobody's going to wait six or eight months for you to get your shit together. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be like, no, this guy looks kind of nice. His model says that it will be green by day December. So I guess we'll give him a pass. Nobody says that. So number one, look at everything monthly. And the reason why a lot of guys don't do it, Gino, is because a, it requires an, a level of complexity that you can't just like copy paste off of somebody, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just like, you know, do this. You can't go to YouTube and just learn this thing, right? Mm -hmm. Number one. Number two, for instance, what we do is we realize small little things like what we were observing in our own business. Let's assume, you know, we rehab 75% of the units as an example. So the rent upside, what we realized very quickly wasn't just on 75% of the units. Now, 90% of the units we could lease at a higher rate just because, you know, when you uplift the property, a rising tide lifts all boats, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Then what we could do is we could basically effectively work on a month by month basis to basically understand all the small little fees that a syndicator can charge, refi fees, incentive fees, you know, on the, on the point of sale, how do you do that? Then when you build your waterfall out, you know, guys try to do it yearly because it's so easy. You know, I take my equity times preferred return and then I get a yearly number for preferred return. And all that, right. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't look at it monthly, what you don't realize is that for the first six months, you might not even be making any money. In fact, your investors might not be making money. So you've got to see all of these things, right? Because when you're in the middle of a deal, you can't be going back to your investors and saying, well, guys, you know what? Just hang on for 10 more months while I get my shit in order. You can't say that, mm -hmm. right? So if you, if you don't look at it properly, then you're never really going to get it. And last point I want to make is, look, guys, I'm not talking about myself, but just generally, if you come across a syndicator or you come across a bunch of guys who are trying to do a deal, but they're underwriting, which is one of the, one of the one of, amongst the many important things, one of the most important things, right? If they basically copied a model off the internet, they didn't learn anything, they didn't do anything, they straight up copied somebody, Right. What does that tell you about the character and the skill of that person? That this person, as soon as they're confronted with any form of adversity or something that's hard, they're just going to straight up take the shortcut. Do you want to be in a relationship with that kind of guy who's going to take shortcuts for everything? I mean, personally, I know I don't want to be in a relationship with that guy. Mm -hmm. And literally, take away all the fancy stuff, that's what it boils down to. If you're working with somebody that's going to take shortcuts earlier, they're going to take shortcuts with your money. And that's cool. it. What other challenges do you see in the syndication realm? Like that's a big challenge to find a sponsor or to find somebody who really is, I guess, qualified to sponsor. What other challenges do you see in that space? What I also see is people don't know how to value stuff, you know? So I see guys who are buying C type, like C type assets at four and a half, three caps in Texas. I'm not even just not California, not New York, in Texas. And the way they spin it is, and look, you can make a case if the asset is very underperforming, right? It's not been properly managed. But these are assets that are properly managed. And the way this do it is, look, the dirty little secret is why they're doing it is because then they can make their due diligence fees up front. And hopefully with a hope and prayer, if they hit a home run, then they can make a lot of money on the back end. But really what they're trying to do is take all that due, the 2% usually a purchase price, they can take it up front, mm -hmm. right? That's why a lot of guys are doing it. And a lot of guys are also thinking just because things worked three, five years ago, they're going to ride that wave. But me and you both know that wave is crashing. Now, when it crashes, we don't know, but it is crashing sometimes. So what, what pitfalls do you see in, in underwriting in the current market? What, what do you see people struggling with or what do you see happening in the future that's going to act, may lead to that? 
First of all, what I see right from a capital raise point of view is people don't raise enough capital. So their back is against the wall from day one. Mm -hmm. Then even if they do raise enough capital, but let's assume you're a first, second time syndicator, or you don't have enough experience, right, with a particular type of value add deal. You know, you'll say, even if you did raise capital, say for a 200 unit deal, and let's assume that's severely undermanaged, you'll say, I'll come in and I'll rehab 90% of these 200 units, 180 units. Now you and I both know, managing a project of 180 units, that requires a lot of patience, skill, and experience. Now, if you're a first or second time person, look, I'm not saying you won't be able to do it, but there's a high probability you won't be able to do it. And at least in the 18 month period that you said you were gonna mm -hmm. do it. Because once you go behind the eight ball, man, you're, you're just playing catch up, right? Then from a pure underwriting perspective, these are operational issues. From a pure underwriting perspective, guys are grossly overestimating what the rent growth is gonna be year on year then what is a rent premium going to be? So just because a broker in their operating memorandum is saying rent premium is $200, doesn't mean it's actually $200. I mean, the guy's trying to sell you a deal. He's not gonna tell you the rent premium is $25. You have to do your own research. So if you don't do your own research, nobody's gonna hold your hand. And then on operationally, what we're also seeing just from, you know, now we're digging into the weeds here, right? People, again, I know I sound like a broken record. People are not looking at monthly results. So they don't see the ebb and flow. They don't see that, yeah, by the end of two years, my debt service coverage ratio might be 1.4, but for the first 18 months, it was 0 0.5. And no bank is allowing, going to allow you to get away with that kind of stuff. Because mm -hmm. they're going to repossess you. So you can't say, hey, give me 20 more months and I'm going to figure my stuff out. You know? Uh -huh. And then on the exit, just to finally cap it off, on the exit, the exit cap is... I mean, guys are just literally going on a hope and prayer there. At the minimum, I think you should be conservative. You should be between 50 to 200 basis points, ideally 100 to 200 basis points. Guys are going, I've seen like 25 basis points, zero basis points. Like, I mean, come on, anybody can make anything look nice if you do that. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, Omar, what advice would you give people who want to get into syndication or syndicate their first deal? I always heard of the sub syndicator where you raise money for another, for another syndicator. If you don't have the sponsor yourself or you don't have the credibility, what do you think about that path? I think that's a good path, but like all things, you know, it depends what type of sponsor you, you start with. Right. So I think even before people decide to say, hey, I want to be a syndicator, you got to realize, I mean, it's a lot of hard work. Right, it's, I look, it sounds cool, right? Because you hear all these podcasts, you hear successful people like yourself and Jay and Josh. You know, you hear all these guys and you know, you guys are killing it. But I mean, you know this better than me, man. It's a lot of sleepless nights. Because you know, one thing goes bad, you can't stop thinking. Like, I think, has Paul Moore ever showed up on your podcast? I've spoken to Paul, yeah. yeah he's, Paul. He's you know what Paul told me? He's a really nice guy, right? He's older, I think of him as a mentor. And Paul told me something, I was, confiding in Paul once, because I have a nine month old son, I said, Paul, I mean, I feel really guilty because I can't switch my brain off and I, I'm with my son and I should be devoting all this time to him and I am, but I'm not really there. You, you know what I'm trying to say? And Paul's like, dude, I have a 18 month old, I think he's, he's got a girl, 18 year old girl, sorry. And he's like, she told me the exact same thing once when she was young, she's like, dad, you, you've got to switch off because you're not here, you're not here. So guys, you can't, like as an LP, you can invest, find the right sponsor, and then you could go do your own thing. As a GP, you can't switch this off. This is going, this is going. So it takes a toll. So just emotionally managing all of that. I mean, everybody's not cut out for that, you know? Uh, that is the bane of my existence. I, I, I can't, I have six kids, so. <laughs> to, to, devote, to devote the time and to shut off, I, I worked, I don't say I work seven days a week, but I think so thinking is yeah. working and it's always constantly, I mean, he'll attest to it. I, I'll, I'll, I'll bing him on the phone 11 o'clock on Sunday night because I just thought of something and I, I can't, sh I can't shut it off because I'm always thinking of the next thing to do. And that's what entrepreneurs are creating the next value ladder, creating the next program, creating the next document. Cause that's what we do. And I think, I think if you don't want to do that, then stay with your W2 job get a paycheck from somebody, but I, I haven't gotten a paycheck from somebody in over 20 years. So I was at, I've had to create my paycheck. So it was an easy transfer for me. And you know, I mean, it's, it just becomes part of you and you learn how to do it. And, and you know what, your kids become part of your business. So yeah. you include them. So my 50 year old is doing our Instagram. My 12 year old is shipping out the swag. They're all gonna be at the live event selling a product. So they're all gonna be intertwined in the business. And that's how I, that's how I, you know, maintain them. They're all going to film camp. So they're all going to start editing my videos and this kind of stuff. So you just include them in that. You, you include them in your business. And if you're lucky, you include them in your life. And I, that's what I've been, I've been able to do. That makes yeah, sense. but it's not an easy thing though, right? I nope. mean, man, you can't switch this thing off. Like I've, a lot of times I've gotten up in the middle of the night and just written something down. Mm -hmm. 
not because I have some brilliant ideas, because I knew <laughs> if I let this idea go, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, you have this mild mm -hmm. sense of insecurity, right? Yes. What if this doesn't work? What if that doesn't work? Mm -hmm. So I, know, I, I totally agree with that. Totally agree with that. So, wow. That's a lot right there. Um, let's talk about the syndication in Florida. You're looking at an opportunity in Jacksonville. How do yeah. you select, how do you select the market? I mean, you talk about Dallas and how did you end up in Dallas? Why did you move to Dallas? Was it just family down there? Or? No, what happened is man, like, so my wife is a physician, so she's American trained and all. So for her, first of all, we were debating, Hey, whether she moved, she should move up to Canada. I should move down. Anyways, long story short, her moving up to Canada would, I don't know from what I had talked to all the doctors there, it might have broken the Canadian government's bureaucracy system. You know, so <laughs> I was so laborious, man. I was like, man, I, this is just, I'm not gonna fill paperwork for the rest of my life. So essentially I told her, okay, if we're moving down, I am not moving to the Canada of the US. I'm moving somewhere south, it's gotta be warm, and that's that, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, I love Texas because I was in oil and gas, but really if you're moving south, at least for me, the only three options, Southern California, Texas, Florida. I'm not a billionaire, so not in Southern California. Not yet. I'm not, not yet. Not, <laughs> I'm not retired like 90% of the Canadians are in Florida. <laughs> so that was kind of out of the picture. And really the only thing left was Texas. So we flipped a coin between Houston and Dallas. We, mm -hmm. we kind of, you know, the word, we like Dallas a lot. So we just kind of moved here and we love it. We love it. That's awesome. great. So how, did you, how do you choose a market to real estate as far as investing in a market? Oh, so what happened is, you know, I, we have like personally what I did is I designed like a I designed like 20 to 27 factors that I was looking at for markets and I thought look a lot of times you know when people are talking they say I feel like that market is really good right because I was talking to a lot of people I asked the same question hey how do you choose your market outside of your home market right mm -hmm. and I, I'd be getting a lot of I feel and I think and I, you know I was like okay well man, that's not a repeatable process like mm -hmm. I can't just feel my way into success Maybe I can, I mean, I don't know, I couldn't, other people can. So what I did is I wrote down all the factors. So I thought I've got to make it quantifiable, right? So if I'm looking at two or three different cities, I've got to take a cold approach, like a quantitative approach. So I have about 25, 27 factors that I look and I laid it down for all the three cities that I felt were good. After doing my economic research, jobs, all that kind of stuff. And we picked Jacksonville followed by Tampa. I really like Orlando, but Orlando, again, the problem is it's so overbought that I mean, things weren't even, numbers weren't even making sense. We have a guru that I know bought a deal there for 20, 204000 a door. And Whoa. it's 1400 bucks a month in rent they're getting. So I don't even know how that even makes sense. I, it must be some silly money out there. Um, I guess, like I said, if you have money parked in a fund and you need to deploy that money, that's what happens. You have to overpay. Or if you have 1031 money sitting there, you have to overpay. And that's what they're doing. But I just, Orlando is one of those markets where if you drive on I-4, I moved down here a year ago, whenever I go to Disney, the traffic is out of control. I mean, the building's out of control. But at what point do you say to yourself, hold on a second, because I'm paying for that growth. It's like buying a, it's like buying a small cap stock where you know the yeah. ratio is 150, but should you pay 150? I mean, like, I don't know. I mean, Amazon just started making money a couple of years ago. I guess it's okay if you're the Amazon, but how many of those Amazon stocks out there that yeah. were, had those astronomical PEs and that, that, that didn't pan out? So um, give me some of those factors. What, what factors do you like? I mean, other than job growth, I mean, what, what else do you look for in, in a market? Hey, I can give you those right now if you want. I can just get it out on my Google Drive and I can just start spitting out factors if you like. People, the be, big people, one people need to hear that because... Um, you know, there's a lot of different factors. I mean, affordability is a big one, right? The median price income. That's why from California, when you're making a hundred grand in California, as opposed to a hundred grand in Texas, it's, it's not even the, forget about the employers saving the taxes. It's about the employees getting a tax break and the affordability. And that whole thing is just amazing what it does, what it does for the, uh, for the Hey Gino, look, my sister, my dad went to school in Berkeley. My sister and brother-in-law work in Mountain View for Facebook and another startup. I love, I love visiting California. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there's no way, man. I mean, look, we make, thank God, we make a decent household income, right? Between mm -hmm. me and my life. Man, there's no way I could afford California. I've mm -hmm. got, I know personally people every time I go visit my brother-in-law, he works in Facebook. He made some boatload of money, okay? And every single time I meet one of his friends, and these guys are, I'm talking guys, I mean, they're young guys making a lot of money, okay? Three, five, six, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000. And they're always complaining. I'm having a tough time making ends meet. And by the way, these guys aren't guys, you know, who have extravagant tastes. They don't go blow their money on stupid stuff. They're really diligent, hardworking people. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, man, if you have your back against the wall all the time, I don't have a snowball's chance in hell. Yeah. <laughs> you know? 
Well, you know what the thing is? When I heard that Tony Robbins and Grant Cardone, they moved their residences from California to Florida and they're making seven and eight figures. It's not that you can pay it. It's that J Jake likes to call it theft. It's basically why should you have to pay for those services? Yeah. And, and you know, that's a choice that, in, that consumers have to make. I felt sort of the same way with New York. I could afford to live in New York. I could afford to pay those crazy. You know, but New York is a cash grab, man. Like my, my wife did a residency in Syracuse. And when I went to New York to visit her, man, Dude, that state is crumbling, man. I know and it that, is. And, and that government is just... Okay. I know. I, I, I'm trying not to get political, man, but that is just straight up cash grab. Well, they just put your money and they don't give it Yeah, it's important you mention that because that's one of the factors. I mean, one of the factors that I look at is the tenant laws and, and, and the actual local government, actually what the government's doing to stimulate it. Because they were talking about New York with Buffalo being the revitalization and creating jobs and all. That's not, that's not happening. The Buffalo economy actually picked up and, and all the housing elevated because of people looking for multifamily deals. That's why the Buffalo market elevated. But other than that, I would stay away from the coast. I really would stay away from those because- Yeah, but you can only revitalize something after it's gone down to the dog. <laughs> That's right. You know, it only happens after yeah. things are bad. It doesn't yes. happen when things are good. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different word, right? Yeah, uh, yeah that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. Sure, give me some of those, give me some of those. Yeah, so hey, I can spit it out for you. You know, big picture wise, obviously it's a big population growth, employment growth, income growth. But what we also look at is components of population growth. Like what's the net domestic migration like? You know, what's the unemployment rank relatively in the country you know we're looking at big msas ideally population it's got to be over five hundred thousand. you know people yes. at the minimum. Oh, yeah. yes you know just for us to have make sure you know what is like say the housing vacancy data what does that suggest what's the rent to home price ratio what's the affordability index like right what is the percentage of people who can afford buying a house then amongst that's those percentage, that's yeah, amongst those percentage of people who are renting by lifestyle you know mm -hmm. because they want to rent and who are renting because of necessity so one thing, one thing I like about the Knoxville market is renting is still $240 cheaper than owning a home. So uh, having a mortgage, having a home costs yeah. more than okay. renting, which is, which, is, which is what you want because you want people to be able to afford to rent. The rent, rent's not so once renting gets to be too expensive, they're going to go buy the house. Yeah. That's what it ends up with. And that big MSA, there's one reason why I like an MSA that's a little bit bigger. You can find the property management company. If you go, oh, yeah, 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 you go into a market with 30,000 people, the challenge is to find a property management company. You can't find one or yeah. to find team members unless you have the, uh, like we have a city called Maryville, which is a feeder of Knoxville. So Maryville is a sub market. It's really, really close. So we can get anyone from Knoxville to go into Maryville to work. But if you're looking at a sub market 30 minutes away from a major metro, that might be a little challenging to find a property management company. So guys, think about that when you're, when you're doing your diligence on your markets. And that's a good point you raised up because just, I was talking to a couple of months ago, there's a town in Texas called Victoria. It's about 92,000, 100,000 people. And we were just, just a friend of mine. He had to move some of his 1031 money. Mm -hmm. So he was looking at a deal there. He lives in Houston. And yeah, we saw a deal. It was like 90, early 1960s vintage. Yeah, it's an okay deal, but pencil out okay. Lots of stuff. There was some value right there, but again, the problem was property management. Mm -hmm. Guy, but he wasn't going to move from Houston, leave his entire life, and then move there for that building. Mm -hmm. You couldn't find good property management. You mm -hmm. couldn't find good people to work there. Not that there aren't good people. It's just that you couldn't find them easily. I yeah. mean, you'd have to be part of the community, yeah. and nobody was moving to Victoria, Texas anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And that's important. I'm glad. I'm glad you stated that. Sorry to interrupt. Keep going. No, no, no. And look, some of the other points are like you know, what are the multifamily permits like? Like I know, again, you're focusing on workforce sizing. We're looking at BC type properties, but it really matters because look, if there's an oversupply of Class A, eventually people move down or up depending on which way things are. So we try to look at that. What's the vacancy right? What's the historic absorption right? How long is the market? How long? How many years to balance? You know, between various classes, right? Mm -hmm. And then basically stuff like you know where we are in the phase of the apartment cycle. What is the effective rent growth like? I mean, these are just some of the aspects we're looking at. And look. Gino, my perspective is, look, you can't argue against a number, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's math. You can't argue against it, right? Mm -hmm. So when we put it down for, say, five of the cities that we think are good, right? We compare that to our home market, Dallas or Houston. You know, look, we have numbers. Then there's no argument after that. Mm -hmm. And number's a number, right? I agree. So what I want everyone to do is hit the stop. Go re rewind it and listen to what Omar just said, because there's a lot of indicators out there that you missed. And number two, if you want them, Come to October, Omar will share with you in October at the live event because those are really important. And I think one of the things that we should point out is the quality of the jobs. 
those jobs yeah. that are coming from Toyota yeah. to, to Dallas, Texas, it's called the job multiplier effect. For every one white collar job, you're getting an additional three blue collar jobs because you need pizza guys and you need delis and you need dry cleaners and you need gas stations to service that one white collar job. So that's 6,000 white collar jobs moving to Dallas, let's say, is going to, I guess, I would say an additional 10,000, you're going you to have other service companies opening up for that. And that's what happened in, in Connecticut when GE left Fairfield, Connecticut oh, and went yeah. to Boston. It's not just you're losing X amount of jobs. You're losing all the surrounding jobs that are servicing those jobs. So that's why governments and, and counties are well within their rights and they should give them huge tax breaks because it's not that forget they're not going to pay $10 million in property taxes or whatever. Those jobs that they're creating, the multiplier effect, those buildings are being full. You know, tenants are paying rent and, and it's just such a huge multiplier effect that I think people lose sight of that. So the quality of the jobs I think is also pretty important. Gino, you're talking like a guy right out of the Northeast, man, when you talk about the GE example. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, went to Fairfield. I went to Fairfield, yeah. so I graduated in 1992. I went to go to GE Capital, try to get a job. They had like 500 applications for two guys. I wasn't that smart, dude. I was probably 490 out of 500, so I had no shot in hell. And then I have all my friends living in Connecticut now, and that, that I'm sorry, but that state's going down in the toilet because they, they can't control the deficit. They can't control anything. And when you lose GE Capital, and they're not coming to Tennessee, they're going yeah. to Boston, bro. They're going to yeah. somewhere that, that costs even more. That I'm sorry, the, the state dropped the ball on that. They should never have lost that company because it's marquee company to have. And hey, they did it. I'm just pointing it out. And that's what's going on. So those jobs left and it vacated and it left a hole. And a lot of guys are really mad at what happened. They should not allow that to happen. So look at the quality of the jobs that you're that you're getting in your in your in your state or in your market. It's really important. No, so. that's a good point. And you know, look at the end of the day. Do you know you moved? I moved. My point is, it's easy to sit and complain and bitch and moan about stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very easy to do. But if you want to do something, you just got to do it. Well, you know what you got to do? Honestly, Omar, I think what you have to do, not just you or me or anybody, I think what people have to do to be successful, I call it the Trinity. I just thought about it today. You have to be focused on what you want, right? You have to have a focus on what you want, not what you don't want. People don't know what they want. Yeah. That's the problem. So what you want, number two, why you want it, right? But you need focus, you need structure, and you need discipline. Those are the, that's the trinity of, uh, of, of being successful, right? The trinity of work is work hard, work smart, and work passionately. You do one of those three, you're gonna be middle class. You do two of those three, you're financially free. You do three of those working, you're gonna become really successful, you're gonna become passionate, and you're gonna love what you're doing. So focus on those three. But the structure, the, you know, that, that, that was talking about the focus, the structure, and the discipline, that will actually tell you, hey, Omar, maybe I should move to Texas. Why am I still up in Canada? Because people don't really stop and think because they're just doing the W-2s and everyone's busy. And no one sits down and tries to plan their life. Stuff happens to them, and they have to course correct. So um, just for anybody out there, that's my two cents. Hey, Josh, trademark that, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> trademark that before another guru just hijacks us. Ah, that's okay. <laughs> I love to share, bro. We're open source here. You know, blockchain is going to open everything up, bro. So everything's going to be open source. So Jake and Gino, we're open source, right? <laughs> we got, I want to ask one last question before we yeah. go to answer questions. What's your best underwriting tip for the listeners? Best underwriting tip, uh, Gino, is yes. to go open a book and teach yourself because no amount, I can, I look, I can sit down, I, I teach, I taught modeling, financial modeling in, in the bank and the company. Look, I can teach you all, all, all you want, but the point is you got to take the next step, man. I so mean, where's so, the book? Where, what can so I find? you where? really want to know the book? If you want to go to sleep, hold on, let me take it out on Amazon. If you want to Dude, know, I, this, I, this is a book that's going to make you go to sleep, but, but if you manage to not go to sleep and read this entire book, man, you'll be better than 99% of the pros. Okay? So listen, it's called Real Estate, Finance, and Investments, Risk and Opportunities by Peter Linneman. How do you spell his name? Uh, yeah, I'm probably butchering his last name. It's L-I-N-N-E-M-A-N. -N -N. No, you he's said a, it perfect. Yeah, Linneman. Uh, yeah. yeah, right? He's yeah. a professor. He was or is or whatever. whatever. Uh, professor Emeritus at Wharton. So you obviously know he's a smart guy. Man, this guy wrote the textbook. Okay? Literally, he wrote the textbook. You go read it. You're good to go. Well, what's good about this is I think as a syndicator, as somebody sponsoring, even if you don't know it 100%, you have to at least be able to convey it to your, to your people. Oh, yeah. And that's the same thing with the market analysis. People got to rewind it, listen to why they like the market so they can convey it. Because you've been talking to me, why Tennessee? 
I have guys in the market. Tennessee is not a flashy state, but if I can convey to them, hey, listen, I love the market. Things are booming here. People are moving. Everyone's coming. That's important to know. So knowing the market and knowing your underwriting are two important things for every guy who wants to syndicate deals. So. Well, again, right. those, are, those are facts and figures, right? It's not just how he yeah. feels. You can back it up why he feels that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because look, like we talked earlier, I was like, okay, there's a lot of feelings here. And my point is, maybe I just don't have the best timing because like my dad made fun of me. He's like, bro, you graduated. I paid all this money throughout your entire life and you graduated in 2008. Like you could not have picked a better year since the Great Depression uh, to graduate from college in finance, in the, in the one profession that was dying. So my timing isn't the best. So I decided to put things on a piece of paper and look at it analytically. I like that. That's great. All right. So Omar, you're young and you've had a, a lot of success in your life relatively. You know, what would be a, a tip you could give the listeners for the best habit for success? Consistency. That's it. Nothing else. Consistency. What does that mean? That basically just means that, look, you pick, my wife is really good at this, by the way, right? What this means is, look, you, you pick whatever you have to do. And a lot of times you just have to see it through thick and thin. You have to see it all the way to the end. Now, yeah, it sucks sometimes, you know, because you've got lots of other things going on. You get better ideas all the time, but it's habits. You know, if you don't get that habit of seeing things right to the end, right, then even if you do have a good idea, the greatest idea in the world, because you never really got into that habit of seeing it right to the end, you'll never really be able to take your great idea and just walk it all the way to the finish line. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, consistency and good habits, maybe like together. Maybe that, that's what I was trying to say. Do you mind if I put in two little caveats to that? The first thing that Jake likes to say is you got to lean in. You got to <laughs> lean, lean into your problem. And the second thing is that's why you should, you should seek partners because a partner is going to hold you accountable and stop saying, yeah. I'm going to wuss. Oh, I couldn't do it. No, do it. Let's help each other out. Let's come up with better ideas because there's power and strength in numbers. So when you're all by yourself out on the island, bro, it's scary out there. But when you have a couple guys navigating with you, it means all – the difference in the world to a lot of people. Help me out as far as getting our first deal, getting our second deal, finding another partner, getting more financing, learning about it, starting the education, starting the brokerage, starting the syndication. It wouldn't happen by myself. I'm not that smart. And I, even though I'm motivated, I don't have that, those kinds of ideas. So to be able to help people around me who have those ideas and to bounce it off, I think is, will help you become more consistent. Yeah, and just to add to that, I feel, you know, a lot of things in life, at least this is my realization now, good for, and good for me, because the day I realized, I was like, yes, I can do something. I don't think a lot of success in life is dependent on your IQ. I think it's dependent on your EQ. How do you emotionally manage yourself yeah. in a situation? If you manage yourself emotionally in a situation, you could have like multiples less IQ than somebody else, and you're going to destroy them. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can talk about that all day. And that's one of the reasons why we like to homeschool our kids because it's not about only schooling. It's not only about A's and B's and arithmetic, it's social IQ. Social has a lot to do yeah. with this. My seven-year-old, I say, Cecilia, how do you make friends? She goes, dad, it's real easy. I put out my hand. I say, hi, my name is Cecilia. Do you want to play? Real easy. Seven-year-old, she rather unlocked the secret to networking. And I think if people learn how to network and create relationships, I think that's one of the keys to being successful. Just being a likable person, do what you say you're going to do, and try to help other people out. Be the go-giver in your life. And you'll see yeah. how exponentially, you don't have to be the smartest guy in the room. You can hook up with the guy who's got the smartest ideas, but help him execute on that. You become wealthy beyond your wildest dreams. And usually the smartest guy in the room is awful socially. <laughs> That's right. So it's good if you're emotionally great. <laughs> That's right. And he's scared because yeah. he's too damn smart. He's yeah. too, for all you guys out there who are over analytical and who are dig jams, right? I'm going to say it again. Oh, yeah. you're good. Just ask me. You're not going to succeed because you overanalyze stuff. There's a point in life where you need to lean in and you need to find somebody who can help you out and who can push you to the next level. Because you yeah. know you're smart and you probably are smart. But the problem is my immigrant family was really successful because they didn't know what they were doing. They weren't that smart. They just figured out, let me buy a house. Let me do it again. Let me do it again. They didn't know there was risk involved. And they, they, they took a chance. They took an opportunity. Guys who are really over, over analytical about certain things, they just get stuck in their own way and they get stuck and they get stuck and then they don't know how to pull a trigger. And then after 20 years of doing that, that becomes ingrained in their psyche and that becomes part of their physiological aspect. And when they look at something, they don't know what's a good or bad opportunity. They look at it from the lens of being a problem instead of being an opportunity, so. I 100% agree with you. And you know, my mom had a great solution to that. So when I, I, I'm, we're gonna go to the next question after this. When I was a kid, she took me to the swimming pool and for, I don't know, like weeks on end, she would take us to the swimming pool. And I'd be the guy, you know, I'd be doing my drills, but I'd never really go to the deep end of the pool. I'd be like, yeah, I'm just gonna float around. Right. So one day my mom tells a swimming instructor, and this is back in the day when you could do these things that she did. If this guy did it now, he'd probably be sued. Uh -huh. right? 
by like somebody who's not even related to me, just like random by swimming. Right? <laughs> she literally told my swimming instructor, I want you to pick up my kid, I want you to drag him to the deep end of the pool, and I want you to throw him. And if he does, if he's not figured out how to swim by this time, he'll figure it out. You know, and I, I, t- I kid you not, literally after what seemed like months of me just dwaddling around in the shallow end of the pool, the guy, he's like, are you sure? It's like, yeah, I'm pretty damn sure. He picked me up, he threw me to the deep end of the pool, and I, I'll be honest with you, I learned how to swim pretty quickly. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yes. A- a- adversity has a way of eliciting talent that would otherwise lay dormant, right? That's right. When it's yeah. swim, you better bet you're going to figure it out. <laughs> oh, yeah. I swear to God, I did not even know I could swim. I, I didn't even know I could float. <laughs> and I learned pretty quickly. <laughs> uh-huh. I love that. Okay. So obviously you've done a lot of deals, taken a lot of action. What would be your best deal you've done and why? Okay. So the best deal I did was literally just bite the bullet and buy my first house. That's it. You know, there's a lot of paperwork and there's lots of, you know, should I do it? Should I not do it? Am I doing the right thing? Have I optimized for the perfect return? Cause I'm, you know, the analytical, just suck it up and do it. Mm-hmm. You know, that was the best deal. Cause if I never did that, if I didn't do a couple other things around it, then you know, it's a momentum based issue, right? If I didn't do that, I won't have the momentum to do the rest of the stuff. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't the best deal, but it was the best deal in the context of everything. Yeah. Got you in the game, right? Got, yeah. the, got the wheels yeah. going. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. What about your favorite book that you've read? Oh, so there's a couple of favorite books, obviously, but a few of the books that I've even recommended on other podcasts, because a lot of guys like to know about real estate book. I think this is related to real estate, but it's not really real estate. It's called Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a book on behavioral economics and what essentially, without boring you, it's a really interesting book. What it basically tells you is essentially how, what are the biases we have and how humans actually, uh, you know, react to things and how do we process information in our brains versus, you know, how theoretically we should be processing information. You know, so what can you do? What are the things you can do? All small little things. And a lot of times you read that you're like, and then when somebody's trying that thing on you, right in the middle of a conversation, like, damn, dude, you just did anchoring right there. Don't do the anchoring anymore. Don't do that. You know, like you, you know, you, or, you, oh man, I just fell prey to the hindsight bias. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. That's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're trying to mirror me, right? Oh, uh, mirror me. Yes, I got it. I like that. And it's awkward when two guys start mirroring each other, then you're just on a tangent. Everybody, <laughs> just, you know, uh-huh. It becomes weird pretty quickly. I, I like that. All right, last one for you. What project are you excited about right now? Well, getting our first Florida deal. The reason for that is that we're ex- we think Florida, at least the market, Jacksonville and Tampa, they're still ripe for the picking. There's a lot of competition, obviously, but we feel they're slightly earlier in the real estate game, at least the submarkets that we've decided. And we feel our investors are really going to have a good time in these submarkets. That's great. Because look, Texas is kind of tapped out, at least from our networks. And a lot of our investors have already invested so much money in Texas that otherwise also they want to geographically diversify. And they know our business model. They know us. So they know when we say it's good to go, it's good to go. Because I've had a few investors saying, well, when do you want to do a deal? When do you want to take my money? I'm like, well, I'd love to take your money right now. But I don't have the right deal for you right now. I like that. How can people reach, get a hold of you? Well, they can go to our website. It's BoardWalk Wealth. So B-O-A-R-D walkwealth.com. They can also email me at omar, O-M-A-R, at boardwalkwealth.com. Or just shoot me a text, 214 727-8643. Great. Mr. Joshua, recap? Uh, I think overall, you know, we we learned the importance of buying right, right? Doing proper, you know, underwriting and selecting the right market. Oh, yeah. We learned a lot more than that. Let me me, me touch up on a little bit. Think big, start small. Yeah. You don't want to start 150 units if you've never done something before. Maybe raise money for somebody else's deal, right? Um, do your due diligence, choose the market based on the X amount of factors that Omar talked about. He said 20, 26 or 27. Even if you get 15 or 20 of those right, you're okay. Compare A, B, and C, right? Mm-hmm. Learn how to actually underwrite the deals yourself. Maybe you don't do it your, on your end from the, very be- from the very beginning. Once you've done 15 or 20 of them, you get something else, but at least finish the model yourself and know what you're looking at. Don't be afraid to spend money on your education. I can keep going on yeah. this Peter Lineman book. I'm going to get the book because I really feel like falling asleep because I need to fall asleep. <laughs> it will put you to sleep. And you know what? But that's the kind of stuff you need to read because that's getting in the weeds. And sometimes yeah. you need to get in the weeds, right? So I would tell everyone, take a look at that book um, and just get out there and, and, you know, take a chance. And if you really want to do it, focus on, 
you know, what you want to do and focus on why you want to do it. Because I wanted to do multifamily because I want to become financially free and I want to spend more time with my family and have a weekends off. And that's a pretty big why for me. And yeah. you know what, when something happened, when something went wrong, when, you know, a deal didn't work or when a refi didn't work, I just kept going. I kept leaning in because I knew there was a big enough reason why I was doing it. If you don't have a big enough reason why, and I can get on the phone with guys and I can tell Josh in 10 minutes, Guy's got a honeypot job. He's not leaving that honeypot job. He does not enough pain. There was a quote by Tony Robbins today that somebody sent over online. It was great. Um, talking about try to have enough pain in your current situation to get away from your problem. If there's not enough pain in the current situation, if you want to lose weight and you're eating ice cream, think of that ice cream tasting like avocado. That'll maybe stop you from eating that ice cream because there's enough pain associated with that action. Make, make the pain that you're going towards less than the pain that you're actually dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, really important for uh, – people to uh you know to gauge and to, to start using on themselves so and one last thing i want to say i'm really excited to join your national event and speak there because nashville is the city where i met my wife oh. so i'm really excited to go to oh, Nashville. great it's a great city 20 yeah. percent of the cranes they've told me are in the city it's booming actually the absorption rate is not great there right now actually there's a lot of concession in the a space over there so but you're going to see there's so much demand in the city right now so many people moving in there so uh we're looking forward to actually meeting getting you on stage, just talking about your whole model. And I'm just excited to, uh, you know, to have you there. I want to thank you for being on the show. And, you know, we'll see you soon. Thanks for being thank here. Thank you very much. It's a great honor, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Boom.